Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it is a very uh, fortunate day for us because we got a great soul here and he is uh, gracing us uh, with uh, his presence as well as uh, he is going to be uh, giving us some spiritual knowledge. So let me introduce uh, His Holiness. His Holiness Bhakti Vikna Vinasaya Narasimha Maharaj was initiated by Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada uh, in London in 1971. A year later he received the second initiation or Brahmana initiation. He has been preaching for over 25 years since in Asian countries such as India, Philippines, China, Taiwan, <coughs> Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia and Thailand. Through his years of preaching, he has given countless souls practical guidance and deep inspiration. Taking sannyas in Mayapur in 1994 from Tamar Krishna Goswami did not mean much of a change in his lifestyle since Maharaj has always been strict in his sadhana. Whoever gets to know his holiness admires and respects his sincere and faithful practice of chanting the holy names of the Lord. He truly walks his talk. Maharaj has been teaching uh, with the uh, Mayapur Institute since its inception. So let us now welcome him and let us uh, very carefully listen to what he has got to say. His Holiness Bhakti Vikna Vinashayam Swami Ma Ma Narasimha Swami Ki Jai! Jai! Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Shankaranga Prabhu explained, I met Sri Prabhupada. I had the good fortune to meet, first of all, his society. First of all, well, I met actually Prabhupada through his uh, devotees, and actually not so much his devotees, but through his books. I got a book about Krishna. And before that, I'd also come across the devotees because they had they recorded music. And you know, in the 1960s and 70s, we were very fond of pop music. And at that time, the devotees had come from the US and they come to London and they met with famous musician George Harrison who was in the Beatles and he got them to make the record of the Hare Krishna mantra. So that Hare Krishna mantra was very popular and was regularly played on radio and television and I also used to sing it but I had no idea what I was singing. I didn't know anything. <laughs> I just thought, that's a song, you know. Oh, it's a mantra, it's a big, it's a mantra. You know, mantras, there, were, there was a lot of talk about mantras and gurus, and, but I didn't know anything really about what was involved. But I liked the mantra. And then, of course, they made the second record, they recorded the Govinda song, the Govinda Madhipur song, beautiful song, and that was my seat to Krishna consciousness, you could say. Although I had an interest also in Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita was a book which uh, we were supposed to study when I was in college. I studied engineering of all things, you know, and uh, we had to take humanities subject, and one of the subjects was Bhagavad Gita. So 
I didn't learn anything really from that either because they were using a, a very different edition of the Bhagavad Gita. At that time, this Bhagavad Gita had not been published. This Bhagavad Gita came only like it was 1973 or 74 before the big, this full Bhagavad Gita could be published. So it's important to get the books, to read the books. That's why devotees, uh, we often go regularly and try to distribute books to people. Of course, people, they don't always understand our intentions and they think that we're just distributing the book to sell the book to get money for our own maintenance or for our own eating and sleeping. But that's not the purpose of our distributing books. We can quite easily maintain ourselves we can quite easily pay the rent and eat and sleep. We don't need to distribute books. But we distribute the books because the books are very important to people. People need to get this knowledge. Education is very important. And we see all over the world, countries will spend a lot of money on education. They will, they, they will organize schools for the children that they can go and get education, learn to read and write. It's, it's a fundamental part of government. Every government budget, they will make some allowance for education to put new schools and then after school, then there should be colleges and universities. Just like here in Malaysia, people go to school and then sometimes they want to study medicine and sometimes there's not enough places for all the people who want to go and study medicine. And they will go to Indonesia to study medicine or they will go to Ukraine in the past to study medicine. And some countries like that, some place even they go to India sometimes to study because they cannot get a place here in Malaysia because the demand, there's so much demand, so many people want to study things like medicine and they will go to foreign countries to study. And so that anyway, the governments, they do their best, it's difficult, it's always difficult to meet the demand. But one point which we want to bring to your attention is that while there's a demand for material education, there's a great need for spiritual education. People need to be educated in spiritual knowledge, not just material knowledge. Material knowledge is in relation to the body and the mind and our senses. But spiritual knowledge is in relation to the soul. We have to understand the importance of this knowledge. Just like Srila Prabhupada went to America. He went to America in the 1960s, a long time ago now. And at that time, India was a poor country and people thought that oh another Swami has come from India and he's coming to beg, he's coming to get money, he wants to take money back to India. But Srila Prabhupada told them, I didn't come here to beg. He said, I came to give, to give you what you like. And he asked them, do you know the difference between a living body and a dead body? <laughs> and Srila Prabhupada asked these kind of questions in the very prestigious university. For example, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. 
commonly referred to as MIT, one of the premier institutes in the world for scientific education. So Prabhupada was invited there to give a lecture and he asked them, you are so many learned men, do you know the difference between a living body and a dead body? No one could answer. No one could answer. They could not give proper answer. They were trying to answer, but they, they, they didn't know the answer. So Srila Prabhupada explained to them the difference between the living body and the dead body is there is no soul in the dead body. All the chemicals are there. All the parts of the body are there. But the one thing which is not there is the soul. At the time of death, the soul leaves the body. So Srila Prabhupada was giving this kind of very fundamental basic knowledge to people in Western countries. We always, you know, here in Malaysia, people look up to the West. They think, oh, the West, America, even they think England, they think, oh, very great. But actually, they're very bad. They're very fallen countries. They're very terrible countries, and they have a lot of problems, social problems, psychological problems. You know, places like America, USA, they had so many mass murders in the last year, where one person would come with a gun and start shooting people in large numbers. That's how insane the country has become, that you're not safe, there's no security anywhere. At any moment your life can be threatened. Although we want to live our full life, at any moment our life can be ended. And now we're seeing also, and just in the last couple of years, we had the pandemic. And again, our life was threatened. Many young people also died because of that pandemic. Not only old people, but also many young people also died due to this virus, this, uh, this COVID virus affecting so many people of all ages. So this is the material world. In the Vedic knowledge, this planet here is called Mrityuloka. Mrityuloka is the planet of death. The planet where everybody is going to die. Everyone who takes birth, one day we will die. We don't know when. But they say, as sure as death. And death is sure. What to do about it? That is the subject matter of yoga. Now you may have heard of yoga before. You may know that yoga is some kind of physical exercises. Maybe you have been to a yoga class. You did some yoga exercises, or maybe you even do some yoga breathing, this kind of thing. That is the preliminary phase of yoga. But the, we should understand what is the real purpose of yoga. The purpose of yoga is first of all to control the mind and senses. We have to understand our identity. We say we have to understand who we are. So Srila Prabhupada would often ask people, who are you? 
do you know who you are? And people would say, oh, I'm a Malaysian. Uh, I'm, a I'm a woman, but I'm a man. I'm young, I'm a schoolgirl, or I'm a student, whatever we may say these things. But these are very temporary designations. Who are we? Even you may say, well, look, I have my passport here, here's my name, and then you can see. That's the name of the body. But the body also changes. The body changes from childhood to youth into old age. The body is changing. But you are still the same. You don't change. And similarly, at the time of death, we give up one body and we take another body. This is the law of transmigration of the soul. The movement of the soul from one body to another, taking birth and dying. So Bhagavad Gita explains to us the law of transmigration. Just like we can see in this world, some people have a body which is very big and very strong, and someone else's body may be very weak. Someone else is born very rich, and someone else is poor. Someone else gets a very good education, and someone doesn't get education. Why? Sometimes people say, we're all equal. We think it's all one, we're all equal. But we're not equal material. Someone is rich and somebody is poor. Can you say everyone is equal? Srila Prabhupada went to Russia in 1971. At that time, Russia was still socialist, communist, was still closed up. The was embracing the teachings of communism. But he saw one man is sweeping the road and the other man is driving the car. He's in the car. Are, is everybody equal? No, of course not. We cannot think everybody is equal. But spiritually we are equal. Materially we're not equal. Materially we have some, somebody has some good and somebody else has some bad. That is what we generally call karma, the law of karma, karmic reactions. We get reactions. People are, some people who did good in their past, they enjoy good in the future. And people who did bad, they suffer. It's not by chance that somebody is suffering. Why are people suffering? They're, they have some bad karma from the past. Now we have the human body. Human body is good karma. It's very good fortune to have the human form of life, different from animals. The dog may live in the street, he has to beg, try to find a master, somebody who will care for him. The trees are also living entities and the trees are standing, tolerating all the conditions and sometimes people come and cut them take off the branches, take all the flowers, take all the fruits, cut the trees down. Just like the coconut, or the oil tree, palm oil, right? And they're, they're, or the rubber trees, they're, they let them grow for some time and they cut them down. Like that. So this, the, the body of a tree is very low in consciousness. Their feet are in the ground, the roots are in the ground. Just like if you have a person 
and you put their feet in the ground, then you have to stand there like a tree. How long you can do it? It's not very nice life. It's suffering. So soul, the soul, some souls are in the body of trees, some souls are in the body of animals, and we are fortunate that we have the human body. We have this human life. It's rare compared to all the other species of life. Mosquitoes, there's so many of them. And then you have the virus, also different viruses which are affecting people. And they are all different living entities. We are fortunate we have the human body. Human body has facilities. You have nice facilities in Malaysia. You have schools, you have hospitals, you have some security, you're quite safe, you can move around without too much danger. With facility, there is also responsibility. Responsibilities in the human life are there. That is important. We get, that's why we get karma. Now the animals, they don't get karma. The dog <coughs> may do something bad, or he makes a mess somewhere. There's no karma for the dog. But for a human being, you get reactions. We get reactions. If we do something wrong, if we break the laws, just like there are laws, the laws are for humans, not for the animals. It's up to the human to take care of the animal. So we have responsibilities. We have to follow laws. And if we don't follow the laws, we get punished. Maybe you get fined or something, just like you're driving your car and you go through the red light, you, you maybe get fined. They have the cameras everywhere and they take pictures and you, they'll send a fine to you and you have to pay. So that's human beings. We have responsibilities because we enjoy facilities, but our greatest responsibility is to understand ourself, to understand spiritual knowledge. Life is not meant for just on, for only solving the economic problems. People work very hard in Malaysia, they're working very hard and they spend so much time to drive to work, maybe they live on the mainland they come over to Penang, drive for two hours, they come to work every day, and then when they go home at night, it takes maybe three or four hours to go home at night. In this way they're working long days just to earn. Why earning? To solve their economic problems. That is a problem. Yeah, we have to get food, we have to have money to live, to pay, rent and to do to pay petrol and different things are there. Edu pay for the children's education, these things. That is responsibility. But that is not the only responsibility. We have also a responsibility to inquire about who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? When I was a student, I always used to ask these kinds of questions to people. And they would simply brush me aside and say, Oh, well, don't worry about it. When you get older, you'll find out everything. You know? <laughs> so they were right. I, did, I found out everything. Now, in my old age, it's all here in the Bhagavad Gita. All the questions are answered here. If you read this book, regularly, you'll get the answer to all of your questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Why am I suffering? 
I want to be happy. Why am I forced to suffer? So these are fundamental questions and it's important for us to want to get answers to these kinds of questions. And the answers are there, but you have to be willing to hear. We have to be willing to hear, not just from anyone, but someone, but we have to hear from the authorities, from the qualified persons. Just like you can see here, we have on the bottom here, you see this five pictures, and then there's another six picture on the end. So this is the, the pictures of our teachers. These are the line of the, the teachers. We say acharyas. Acharya is a Sanskrit word and it means one who teaches by example. I give the example, you know, when I was a schoolboy, teachers used to say, don't smoke. Smoking is very bad. And we used to think, but sir, you smoke. Your hands are all brown from the cigarettes. <laughs> and you're telling us not to smoke. So that kind of teaching is not good. We want to see example. The example has to be there. So this, uh, these people, they're all acharyas. They teach by their example. Yes, example. Just like teacher may say, chant Hare Krishna mantra. So this teacher chanting, he has to also chant, right? Teacher may say, don't eat meat, fish, and eggs. Is teacher also not eating meat, fish, and egg? Yeah. So, like that. Acharya, he has to teach by example. But we want to see that example from the teacher. Then we can be inspired to follow the teacher. So it's very important that we hear from people who practice what they teach. They don't just say one thing and do something else, but they actually practice what they teach. So the Bhagavad Gita is teaching us this knowledge. This knowledge comes originally from Lord Sri Krishna, Bhagavan Krishna. This book, Bhagavad Gita, is a conversation, a dialogue, two people, Krishna and Arjuna. Krishna and Arjuna. Arjuna is the student and Krishna is the teacher. So when Krishna speaks in the Sanskrit, the book was originally composed in Sanskrit. Actually, the book was it, it, it was a conversation which actually took place 5,000 years ago. There was a, going to be a great war, a great battle was going to take place. And it happened that just before the battle, Krishna spoke to Arjuna. Because Arjuna, the student, he came with questions. He had doubts. He wanted to know, am I doing the right thing? He asked, he asked Krishna, please instruct me, please tell me what I should do. Making decisions is always difficult, you know. We have to make decisions constantly, right? We make, should I cross the road? Should I go? Is the light changed, you know? Like that we are always making decisions. Am I going to sleep tonight? Am I going to eat tonight? Am I going to watch television? You have to make decisions. But there are major decisions to be made also. And in this particular case, Arjuna had to make a very major decision. But he was intelligent because he understood better to take help from someone than try to solve the problem myself. And therefore he approached Krishna, who was his friend, but he inquired from Krishna. And he asked Krishna, he said, you please guide me, please be my teacher and instruct me. 
what should I do? Arjuna said, it's difficult for me to decide what to do. His, Arjuna said, my problem, my problem is that I have a, a weakness. I have a miserly weakness. Do you have any miserly weaknesses? We say dosha. The word is dosha. Right? If, you, if you go to the astrologer, did you ever go to astrologer to get your astrological chart done? And they will tell you, you know, if they're a good astrologer, they can tell you, oh, yes, you will be a very rich person, you will be very happy, you will have five children, you know. <laughs> you know astro some astrologers, they can tell you these things. Not all. There are many cheaters also. <laughs> but there are some good ones. And they will tell. So if you have, oh, you may say, oh, you have some dosha. You have some doshas in your astrological chart. Dosha means faults. Do you have any faults? Do you have any faults? Maybe, eh? <laughs> we have a few faults, maybe. Of course, everybody got. Right. Either many or a few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, being, you're being honest, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, dosha. Arjuna said, I have fault, but fault in my miserly weakness. You know what his miserly weakness was? His miserly weakness was that he was attached to the body. Attachment to the material. It's a cause of the bondage. Attachment to the physical body. We are thinking ourselves to be the body. We're not understanding our real identity as a spiritual being. This is brought out uh, in the course of speaking the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna explained that this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, it's not Indian. It's not Hinduism. Although sometimes people think, oh, this is Indian, this is Hindu. No, it's not. It's much older, it's much before all that. It, the history of this Bhagavad Gita is described that previously this knowledge was spoken to the sun god on the sun planet, the sun god. There's a sun god there on the sun planet. And that knowledge of Bhagavad Gita was spoken to him millions of years ago. So this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita is eternal. And it's not for just people in India. It's not for just Hindus. I'm not a Hindu. Right? You can see. But this knowledge is for everyone. So when, when the Krishna was explaining about this to Arjuna, Arjuna was surprised. He said, he said, Krishna, how did you speak this knowledge to the sun god? The sun god is much older than you because Arjuna and Krishna were friends. They were the same age. They were friends with each other. So Arjuna was surprised because Krishna was saying, I instructed this knowledge to the sun god. So Arjuna said, but what? How, how could you give this knowledge to the sun god? You and I are the same age. But Krishna said, Many, many births, both you and I have had. And Krishna said, I can remember all of them. You cannot. Right? Do you remember? Do you remember your previous birth? No. We don't remember. But we had a previous birth. We have had many births. Speaker, speaker. 
So Krishna said, many, many births both you and I have had. Krishna remembers, we don't remember. But definitely, we have had many different births. Now we have this particular body. We don't remember. We don't remember what body we had before, but we had a body. We've had many bodies in many different places. It's not that, oh, I'm Malaysian. The body, this body took birth in Malaysia, but our soul is eternal. And we have to understand this body, it's just like a dress. And just like you change the dress, we change the body. As I said, childhood body, young man's body, middle-aged body, old-aged body, the body changes. Just like the dress. I can change the dress. You can change your dress. We are the same. The body is just the dress of the soul. Our real identity is spiritual. We are spiritual particles. We are not simply physical. And when you understand that, then you won't worry so much about dying. Because you understand that death is just simply the change of body. Of course, we do want to think about what kind of body you're going to take in the future. Just like now, we have the human body, but there's no guarantee that in the next life we will again have the human body. The human life is where we are earning our karma. If you do some good deeds, the seeds you plant, you will harvest them. In the Christian Bible they say, as you sow, so shall you reap. Yeah. 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 So that's conversation. Every country in the world they have that. You see, even in China, although China, they don't really believe in God, they don't have a lot of religion there, but they have that saying in the culture, right? It's taught to people. You do good, you get it. You do bad, you get it. What is good and what is bad? That we have to learn. We have to learn what is the proper standard for human being. Just like I said, the animals they don't follow the laws. The laws are for humans to follow. So that, in, a, in terms of different countries, is different laws. But there are spiritual principles. The standard in the, in the ancient teachings of yoga, they talk about dharma. And they talk about sanatan dharma. Sanatan meaning eternal religion. Dharma is more than religion. Dharma means actually something like the nature, just like the Dharma of chili. Chili will be hot. Sugar will be sweet, right? So the same way, we are also living entities. We are souls. What is our Dharma? Our Dharma is service to do service. Maybe you're a mother, you have a child, you serve your children, you serve your family, then you serve the country, you serve humanity. Where some people serve their dog. 
people are all doing something. <laughs> but the real service, the ultimate service, is service to the Supreme, to the Supreme, to God. We have to understand there is God, there is the Supreme Person. And we are all meant to cultivate our relationship to Him. And just as we are persons, God is also a person. We do believe in creation. Creation means there's a creator. How did this world come about? Where did it all come from? Do we, you know, the scientists, they give us some atheistic theory about the origin of life. They will say, the Big Bang Theory. Did you ever hear the Big Bang Theory? <coughs> no? Big Bang Theory. You, you never studied science, huh? Oh. <laughs> anyway, it's an it's a atheistic theory how life came about. Is it about Adam and Eve? What? Is it about Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve? No. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Christian teachings, right? Anyway, the, the point is there's a creator. Just like, you know, this microphone. Oh. Where did it come from? There, somebody made it, right? And just like this book, how did it come? Somebody printed it. Everything, somebody does it, you know, where does it come from? Oh, somebody made it. And similarly, the universe, when you look at the universe and you see all the planets and the stars and how everything is moving in so carefully controlled orbits, it's so amazed and so... Who, who arranged it all? That's why sometimes my children will ask, how does the rain come from? How does the cloud come from? How does it all... Children will ask all these things. Can you answer? <laughs> you have to read the book of the Gita. You have to read this book. So all the answers is from that book. Yes. <laughs> so I must. Rita is a creator, is it? Huh? Is it a creator? Yes, there's a creator. There's a creator. There is a creator, yes. Creation. We don't believe in evolution. No, I must go home and pay more attention to this book. Only I will get the answer. E evolution. <laughs> if I want the answer, I should read it. Yeah. So, all the knowledge is actually within us. It's all within us. But we have to awaken that knowledge from within. And the way in which we can awaken this knowledge is by chanting. We have to chant. We have this mantra, the Maha Mantra. Now sometimes mantras are sold and people do a business with mantras. And they ask you to pay some money and they'll give you a mantra. But this mantra which we're this, ma this mantra which we are giving, the Maha Mantra, it's, it's free and we give it to everyone and anybody can chant. Some mantras are very strict. You have to be, or you have to be a vegetarian, or you have to do this, or you have to do that before you can chant this mantra. But this mantra, the Maha Mantra, is for everyone, in any position, in any condition of life. They can chant the Maha Mantra and they will get great benefit. What benefit will they get? One benefit they'll get, it destroys past sinful reactions. It takes away the, react, the things, the bad things which we have done in the past. The effects of our sins can be removed by this mantra. And another benefit of the mantra is, it gives us transcendental knowledge. It allows us to awaken transcendental knowledge. Knowledge about our own self, a 
the spiritual being. Yeah. So that is the Maha Mantra. Very simple mantra. Just simply three words, Hare Krishna and Rama. But put in the form of a mantra, so it produces a divine sound vibration. The sound vibration which comes from God Himself. And it comes and manifests on our tongue. And it takes away the reactions which, we're, which is binding, which is keeping us in this world. And it gives us transcendental knowledge to understand our real self. Who I am, why I am here, where we're going. We have to think about these things. This is our responsibility. Human life is meant for inquiry. And if we don't inquire, then we have wasted the human life. Because what are we going to do if we don't inquire? You're simply going to eat, and you're going to sleep, and maybe you'll have some sex and have some children and like that, and you will also defend. So we'll do these four things. But that's what every species of life is doing. The dog is doing that. The birds are doing that. The fish are doing that. You, do, you don't need the human body just to do these things. Human life is a special facility to inquire and to search out, to understand the truth. And this is very, this is the whole purpose of Scriptures. The scriptures are meant to give us that knowledge, to guide us, to awaken us, to answer these kind of questions. So we ask all of you, you try to do this chanting, this Maha Mantra, the Hare Krishna Mantra, this is how we begin our spiritual life. And in order to get better results from the chanting, we encourage you also to be vegetarian. Don't eat the non-veg, meat, fish and eggs, these things, they're not pure food. We want to eat the healthy food, food which is pure, which is nourishing and satisfying. And we have that. We have that kind of, it's available. Here in Malaysia, you have no problem. You have so many vegetables and so many beans and grains. Everything is there. Why do you need to eat? Why do you need to kill the animal? You don't need it. <coughs> And, if, and especially you should not kill the cows, because the cow is a very special animal. Yes. Because the soul from the cow in the next life will become a human being. And to kill the cow is considered very sinful. So we have to understand these laws. There are four principles of religion. Cleanliness. Everywhere people will understand cleanliness is very important. Now with COVID also they're saying, you know, wash your hands, and put the sanitizer hands and like this thing. They, they say all these things. So external cleanliness is important. Internal cleanliness is also important. That is the most important. Yes. How are you going to clean the heart? Easier to say, yeah. How are you going to clean the heart? You have to know, you have to be trained, you have to be taught, education, how to clean the heart. We chant the Maha Mantra. The mantra, that mantra is made up of special spiritual names which will cleanse the heart, keep us clean. So cleanliness is important. Then. Mercy is also important. We should be merciful. Who should we be merciful to? We should be merciful to all living entities. 
especially the elderly, our parents. Yes, of course. It's, but not only human. You know, you can't say, oh, I'm merciful to my parents, and you sit and eat your mother cow. <laughs> you know, there, we have seven mothers. Cow is also mother, you see, because she gives milk. Just like mother gave milk when we were children, so cow also gives milk. Cow is also like mother. So if you eat your mother, it's not merciful. <laughs> <laughs> right? You don't eat the mother. So mercy, then austerity. Now, well, what does that mean? Austerity. Austerity means to give up pride. Humble. Yes, to be humble, right. We, th these qualities are appreciated everywhere. To be humble, and that, that is an austerity, to be humble. We need to cultivate that kind of quality. And if, we're, if we take things like intoxication, because intoxication is another form of pride. Someone's very proud, they're very intoxicated, they're proud of it. It, it, it's, it's not good. We want to get rid of that. So we want to also cultivate some austerity, to be humble. In the Christian Bible they say, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Did you hear that before? No? It's in the Bible. And similarly, a devotee who practices yoga, they also practice humility. Offer all respect to others and not eager to be respected themselves. Rather, they want to offer all respect to others. This is austerity. That so cleanliness, mercy, austerity, and one more, truthfulness. We should be truthful. We shouldn't lie and cheat. We should be honest. Okay. But if we gamble and do these kind of things, then it encourages people when they're cheating. So we want to practice these four principles. And this helps us to understand more about our real self as a spiritual being and our relationship with God. Because we clean the heart, we control the mind and senses. You know the most difficult sense to control? Oh, we have five senses, right? And which sense is the most difficult to control? Would you know? Is it the mouth or my mind? The, the, mouth the, the mouth. tongue. The tongue. The tongue. Very difficult. Want to eat and want to talk also. Right. <laughs> <laughs> want to eat all the garbage. <laughs> from, from the tongue and the mouth. Yes. We eat the all the garbage and we talk all nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Make some money gossip a lot. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> we have to learn to control the tongue. And the mind, of course, is even more difficult. The mind is the sixth sense. The mind controls the senses. So to control the mind is even more difficult. The tongue is one of the senses, but mind is subtle. So the subtle senses are even more, more difficult to control. But we can do it by practice. You have to practice. And the practice is to chant Hare Krishna Mantra and to read Bhagavad Gita. You read the Bhagavad Gita. I've been reading this book, Bhagavad Gita, for many years now. And it, there's always more things. There's always new knowledge there to read and to understand. So it's very nice to go through it. It's not like a novel, which you read one time and put it down <laughs> and finish. You read it, oh, I read it. You know. But this book, you have to read it a little bit and read it again and read more and read it. And you
and keep reading and reading. And even if you've read it all, you read it again and you read it again and again. And you get more and more every time you read it. It's very full, very complete in knowledge. Knowledge which we didn't get when we were studying at college, getting our education. Right? Did you go to college? Yes. You go to college, you study, you get a degree in them. But you don't know anything. When I went to college, they used to have a competition every Friday night. Who could drink the most beer? <laughs> a beer drinking competition. And every week the winners were the medical faculty. In other words, the doctors were the ones who could drink the most alcohol. So that lets you know what a doctor's like, you know. <laughs> Alright? So are there any questions? You have any question? Now is the time? Hare Krishna. So, I think uh, tonight Maharaj gave so many uh, food for thought <coughs> for us to go back and think. I hope you all can remember what he talked about. You know? uh, maybe sometimes it's like uh, come inside here and come out that way. But even if you can remember one, that's very, very wonderful. You know, maybe you won't remember all the points, but if you can remember even one point, that's actually very wonderful. <coughs> so, again, thank you all for coming and we thank. His Holiness for, for you know, uh, giving us so much of uh, no, uh, spiritual knowledge in this short space of time. Uh, and then after this now we are going to have uh, some uh, uh, book distribution. Uh, so we are going to request, <coughs> we are going to request Maharaj to give uh, some books to certain chosen people <coughs> uh, because they have done a lot of services. So as we call the name, please come forward. Also, uh, uh, bring that. Bring that. Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, so also, if if if. Uh, okay.